Hey everyone, it's Zach with Palantir Research. Shyam Sankar, the CTO of Palantir, just had a new interview come out with the No Priors podcast. And he goes into detail on his thoughts around Palantir, their products, and provides a lot of background and context that brought the company to where it is today. And for quick background on the podcast host, it's ran by Elad Gill and Sarah Guo. Basically, they're successful founders and investors in the tech space. Sarah, the founder of an investment firm called Conviction, but also in her past was the youngest partner at the firm Greylock, becoming partner at 28 back in 2018. And Elad Gale had sold one of his companies actually to Twitter and has become a prolific investor in the tech space. So they've had a pulse on the tech landscape, of course, from their experience. But today I wanted to focus on the last question that was addressed regarding Palantir and healthcare because it resonated very strongly, at least on my views for the future use cases of AI in healthcare, but also how that can be expanded to other industries and really is already happening today. So I'll play the clip first, and then I'll let you know my thoughts after. One area that I know that Palantir added quite early on as a vertical was healthcare. And you mentioned some of the work that you did during COVID. I know that last year, uh, Palantir announced, I believe, as a 10-year partnership with Cleveland Clinic to improve patient care. And when I look at the implications of LLMs and generative AI to healthcare, there's so much low-hanging fruit because it's such a big, people-intensive services industry. It'd be great to just hear your viewpoint in terms of how you work with some of these healthcare customers and what you think this coming wave of AI will do? Like, what are the areas that will be most impacted by that? Yeah, healthcare is roughly a third of our business. It's it's certainly, I mean, it's probably one of the fastest growing parts of our business as well. Uh, and and we do that, uh, you know, in in a number of countries. So the NHS in the UK and, and multiple hospital systems in the US, and across both kind of dimensions of clinical care and operational care, like the op- hospital operations. And I think that's relevant because the, the pace of adoption for, for these will uh, vary and, and kind of the challenges you solve for the use cases with LLMs is different between them. I, I think the operational context is is very obvious in the sense that it's just like operating any institution, really. You, you have kind of supply, demand, you have labor inputs to that, you're trying to manage that so that you can deliver the product, the care that you actually have. And there it fits very cleanly to how will we help, you know, auto companies get better at what they're doing or how will we help manufacturers or energy companies. Um, and, and there, I, I think, probably the archetypal pattern that I see across all industries is something like you today have something, if you squint at it, it looks like an alert inbox where uh, your state machine is essentially saying, here's an exception or something that I need someone to think about. And the human kind of, then you have so many exceptions. I need some help prioritizing all these alerts and then you prioritize them and you, and you deal with them. What the promises of, 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 LLMs and what we're focused on with AIB is turning that from a place where I'm surfacing alerts to a human to I'm surfacing solutions. Uh, So instead of saying, here's an alert, what should we do about it? It's, Here's a recommendation. Here's a staged scenario of what you could do about this alert that's happened. Do you approve or reject it? And that's a concrete manifestation of, of the uh, like kind of co-pilot. Uh, and, and what I really like about that is like it to the point of like having done the foundational work. For that to really work, you need a primitive that is the scenario that is this like staged edit. You know, like a branch uh, in, in Git, right? Like without that, that's a very powerful primitive. Without it, you you lose a lot of capabilities if you have to build that at every customer over and over again. So having having something that the LLM can say, look, here's a branch and here's a stage set of edits. And then I can have a human evaluate that in the operational context of how they view uh, hospital capacity. That, that that's, that's one set of workflows. And then on the clinical side, I think it's really about reducing human toil. Like I, I don't think you're trying to get the uh, LLM to decide what, you know, it, what to do for the patient here. It's, it's probably exactly the domain of, of the doctor here. But what's in the clinical records and the clinical histories? How do I drive the workflows? What is it that the doctor can't get to or, or the nurse staff can't get to today? Because it's, it's just too much toil and that we can turn that into something that takes, you know, maybe 400 milliseconds. And that's gonna improve what's happening at the point of care. So driving completeness in that picture. Uh, and, and I kind of see that as a natural dichotomy between operational and analytical workflows. And the, the other thing I was looking at today is how do you optimize the throughput of a state machine. So like I was looking at this claims processing workflow and then I was looking at this like claims optimization, like what's wrong with my state machine? It's almost the question. And this one, the second one is for like a manager who's looking down at this and they're saying like, oh, there's a cycle here and what's, you know, and so this, the sorts of manipulations you're trying to do with the LLM is, is structurally more analytical. You're not asking it to change the state machine. You're not asking it to, you know, there, there's no magic button there to press. In the operational context, you can get closer to something that's more like, give me a recommended action that I can evaluate as a human. And then there's kind of thresholding and learning over where might that be most valuable? And I certainly think one of the things that's promising about that is today we're so constrained by, is it worth solving this alert? You know, because what, what are my human costs to go after solving this alert? In a world where the LLM can process all the alerts and give you a staged set of actions, now you're, now you're prioritizing not on the severity of the alert, but on the possible consequences of the solution. Uh, so that, that's already an improvement in the sort function. And then you're much more likely to be able to get through all of them. 
So this interview is following Alex Karp's op-ed on the New York Times. So that was regarding the future of AI, focusing on the government military side, and of course, regulations and the philosophy and ethics around that. Now, if you just scroll through Twitter, you're going to see plenty of opinions, some informed and basically a lot of them uninformed on their view of Palantir and of course, AI in general, being involved with the government and weapons and all that military side, but also spouting their opinions on the direction that we should go. Now, I already have my own perspective and biases, of course, but having been following the company and leadership over some time, I'd say at least they'd need to have a place at the table to voice their opinion, considering they're actually working on the real use cases of AI, implementing that, and actually having a substantial amount of participation in the outcomes of using this kind of technology in a war context, and of course, integrated with weapons. Just ask Ukraine. Now, for Shyam's interview, I see it as a way for Palantir not necessarily to counteract this, but to continue putting themselves out there, of course, in different lights. Now, if you try to reach everyone, you'll reach no one. So they just continue to stay with their philosophy and vision for AI and Palantir's part in it. Of course, this is a less controversial topic and interview, but thinking of it as a shotgun kind of approach, Palantir wants to get their name out there in as many avenues as possible because this slowly captures their target audience and also increases the chances of other types of media compounding on this and stringing up and snipping their media and sharing it. So it's great to hear Shyam mention healthcare is around a third of their business today from the interview. Now, the metric he's using, if it's revenue or customer, I'm not sure actually, but definitely has been a large part here. And you see it in a lot of in the PR announcements with their partnerships and, of course, AIPCon with their many partners that were presenting how they're using Palantir. Now, what I liked most was how he's comparing running a healthcare institution is kind of the same as any other organization, at least operationally. Now, people have their own opinion here because especially it's very personal when it comes to medical issues and getting that taken care of. So it is very personal and it can kind of get in the way of things when trying to run an organization, even though, you know, logically you may just run it the same way as a business. You break it down to the human level of what actually we find valuable from AI which is giving us solutions and working faster and more efficiently. Not just giving me alert after alert and figuring it out, but rather taking everything happening into account for a full picture where the consequences are weighted more heavily. And this is just in comparison to see if it's resource intensive and we just have to not prioritize it. Now, to bring the human side to healthcare, the clinical end, so this he separates it out from operationally, is trying to show AI should be seen as a way to help the clinical staff of doctors, nurses, techs, any of those people with the human controlled areas while using their experience there, of course, but driving the automated functions in the background more quickly along. Because in the end, everyone would win because the clinical staff can focus on what their strengths are. And then, of course, the computers can do the mundane, repeatable tasks, maybe reading data and compiling things. So when he also simplified this all outside of the healthcare context and really visualizing for viewers what the end state can be, I think this can draw in at least more interest on the capabilities of Palantir and working with your organization, especially if you've already gotten to a place where you truly need to transform your organization because you can easily integrate AI securely to your business, of course, if you go through them. But what are your thoughts on this? How did Shyam do in your opinion? Did you learn anything new from this interview? Let me know below and I'll see you in the next video.